All right, you ready to dive in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I, will, I think I will just start. I'll tee it up, up to you to kind of talk about how you got into the industry, and then we'll, we'll just go from there. Okay, should I, should I do that now? I'll introduce you. I mean, I wanna, I'll just say I'll thank you, and then I'll, I'll kick it off to you. Steve, welcome to Playmaker. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Hold on. <laughs> you are listening to Playmakers, the podcast, the only podcast, the best podcast. I just love saying the word podcast. In this week's episode, I've got an incredible guest with one of PC Gamer's gods of gaming. A god. I don't even believe in God, but I've got a god. In this week's episode of Playmakers, I hope you're excited. We are going to talk all about IP development, text adventures, and much more. Have you figured out who it is yet? Let's see. It's coming right up right here, right now on Playmakers. You can feel the excitement, maybe maybe a little too much excitement. We've got a great guest this week. Someone who is incredibly well-known and beloved for their work on famous text adventure games at Infocom, The Planet Falls, The Zorg Zeros, The Leather Goddesses of Phobos, um, which may give away who I'm talking about for many of you. This guest was named one of PC Gamer's 25 game gods, uh, which is a pretty cool title if you can get it. Uh, He also worked as a VP of Games at King, a VP of Creative at GSN, a VP of Game Design at Playdom Disney. We talk about some of those experiences and some stories from those years um, and many, many other accolades and uh, adventures along the way. This is also someone who, you know, I'm so lucky to have gotten to know a little bit. And this guest is is just like you would imagine him to be if you have played, you know, some of the Infocom games. He's witty, he's wry, he constantly keeps you on your toes. And um, and it's just a pleasure to to get to know him. And I'm so excited to share this interview with him today. So ladies and gentlemen, this week's guest is the great Steve Moretzky. Now, before we get into the interview, I just want to invite you to, if you haven't, make sure you are subscribed to the podcast. If you are enjoying the show, make sure you are letting your colleagues know about it so that um, they can also benefit from the knowledge and the wisdom that we work hard to bring you in Playmakers. Um, So yeah, subscribe, write a review, all those things, really appreciate it. And of course, as ever, feel free to reach out to me personally, jordan at brightblack.co, and let me know what you would love to see more of in the show, what kind of guests you want to have on, what kind of topics you want to have covered. I just love that stuff. And I really appreciate it. So you can always email me right there. Okay, I won't keep it any longer. Let's get into the interview with Steve Moretzky. Steve, welcome to Playmakers. It's great to have you on the show. And it is a delight to be here. So just, I wanted to, first of all, we're, we're just, we were both cracking up right before we started the interview for unrelated reasons, but Steve always makes me laugh. Steve, Tell us a little bit about how you how you got into and got started in the game industry. Well, in 1981, which is when I earned my first dollar from the game industry, there weren't really a lot of proven entry points. There certainly right. were no game programs that were turning out young people primed to, to work in the game industry. My path was like just about everyone in the game industry at that point sort of unpredictable and and unplanned. Happened to know many of the people who founded Infocom, just socially from MIT. Most specifically, we were all running the MIT film and lecture program. And so I ended up graduating with a degree in construction management, which is what I did professionally for the first couple of years after I graduated. And like that. I'd say there there were things in my life that I liked less. For example, <laughs> getting a colonoscopy. But for the most part, it was not fun. It was just really boring. And, and you know, the, the people were boring. The work was boring. Uh, this was in New York. And it was things like schools, prisons, public buildings. And pretty much the assumption going into every single project was it's going to end in a lawsuit. 
And pretty much if I had to sum up my job, it was essentially documenting every single freaking little thing that happened in the project to support what would eventually be a court case, you know, basically arguing over the finances of the, the project once it was completed. Okay. So it's, so it's almost like you, it, it was in school, it was more of a design task planning and kind of putting the pieces together. But then in reality, it was, it was more of like a documentation kind of thing. Well, it was much more of a cutting edge planning task in mm-hmm. school and a, about as far as you could get from cutting edge planning task in the field. So anyway, two years of that, and, and I was so ready to, to do anything else. At the time, I was uh, sharing an, an apartment with Mike Dornbrook, who was another one of these people who was involved with the film and lecture program. And he had basically been Infocom's one paid tester. And he had an Apple II in our kitchen where he did the testing. This is before Infocom even had an office. And when he wasn't using it, I would sometimes use it to play Zork 1 and then later Zork 2. And of course, these were pre-release versions of the game that were pretty buggy. And just as I was playing for fun, I would write down bugs, just as he was doing. Of course, he was getting paid for it, and I wasn't. But then he went off to business school in Chicago. And Mark Blank, who was one of the founders of Infocom, and the I guess his title was probably VP of Development or... Yeah, I think that was his title. Anyway, he said, you know, we just lost our tester. Would you like to be our new tester? You've been doing it, you know, on Zork 1 and Zork 2 anyway, and now we have this new game that I'm writing, Deadline. And I said, sure. And so basically I took over the Apple II and began testing Deadline, and that was November of 81. That was when I earned my first dollar in the game industry. And, and uh, how you go from... from- testing on the Apple II to writing and designing for, for Infocom? So I did testing for about a year. And then Mark said, how would you like to try writing your own game? I said, sure. And I started working on my first game, which ended up being Planetfall. And then for a good Wait, chunk on, of a on. year... There's got to be something in between. How did, how did Mark must have seen in you? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'd known him for years by that point, And I guess, you know, he thought that I was a creative and or funny person, but there wasn't a lot of. That does come through, Steve, very, very, very quickly with you. I, I guess I'd say there were, you know, there just wasn't a lot of risk in saying to someone, do you want to try writing a game? I mean, they were one person efforts, the, you know, the system, the game writing system already existed. You know, you could basically say, okay, spend a few months doing this. You know, if it's not coming out well, then we've wasted a few months of your time. It's not that big a deal. It's not like, you know, we've sunk $10 million into the effort. So I've never really thought that it was that unusual that he said, hey, do you want to give a try at it? And in the meantime, I I kept starting to to create the game part-time, but continuing to do testing part-time. And that game, as I said, was Planetfall, ended up coming out in, so I started writing it in the fall of 82, and it, and it was released in the fall of 83. So that was and, my, and how did you approach writing it? Did Mark give you any mentorship in terms of how to structure this, how to think it through, or, or was it intuitive for you based on the testing you had done? Yeah, at that point, Infocom had already published half a dozen games. Uh, the three Zorks, Starcross, Suspended, uh, Deadline. So, you know, I'd played a number of games. I certainly knew the format. I knew the the structure of the games well. I picked science fiction as the genre just because that was my personal favorite genre in, in terms of what I like to read. And I also wanted kind of a, a big defining pillar of the game was I wanted there to be one major non-player character. So the game so far, you know, the Zork trilogy, it had a number of characters, the thief, the wizard, the demon, the dragon, and so on and so forth. But because each game had a number of characters, there wasn't a lot of 
sort of attention or resources devoted to each one. Yeah. And similarly with Deadline, the, the first mystery game, there was this whole array of of suspects. And, and so there were sort of too many to make each one all that deep. So a pillar for me was that there would be one major non-player character. And, and because of that, I'd be able to make that character kind of deeper and more interesting. And that character uh, ended up being the robot Floyd. That's the sidekick? Yeah. Yeah, you know, when I was when I was researching for this interview, what, you know, everyone knows knows you so well for comedy, but one of the things that came up in that research was that, you know, people were saying that, you know, Planet Paul was one of the first games or the first game that ever made them cry or feel sad. And and it was related to that, to that character. Yeah, which which is so odd cuz, you know, almost every game makes me sad. I'm joking, but, you know, just when I play so many games and I just see kind of lack of originality or not pushing the envelope forward in any way. It just sort of makes me sad that so much effort and so so many resources were kind of wasted on putting out another clone or another very unimaginative game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I definitely want to talk through IP development with you and kind of get into that. Before we do, I just want to to ask, you know, having seen the industry develop over these many, many years, lots changed, obviously, like, for example, how much sort of risk or how much investment up front people put into games. What are some of the things that you think haven't changed, principles that have stood the test of time in terms of producing great stuff or succeeding in the industry? I think a big one is just that to be a hit, kind of everything has to go right. There are so many things that go into a game and not just in development, but in, you know, the original concept in the IP, if you have one in the kind of match between the, the theme and the mechanic and the target audience and the, the marketing. And, you know, if, if, if it's, you know, retail uh, channel, you know, sort of everything that goes into getting the game into the channel and, and selling it. And of course, if it's a free to play game, everything that goes into user acquisition and then live ops of the game, etc. And so there are just so many places where a weak link can kind of make the whole, the whole chain fall apart. And, yeah. and it really, you know, you really have to kind of hit on every cylinder to, to be a success. And, and I think that's what makes game development so hard. There are just so many moving pieces and you kind of can't screw up a single one of them. Do you feel like you can tell during a project when it's on track for that sort of thing? Like there's an energy or an excitement that carries through or is it something that you really don't know until it's out there? Sometimes you can tell from the very beginning. I think a big kind of clue is when people on the team are playing the game, even when they don't have to. Mm -hmm. But then there are plenty of cases when it feels like, wow, you know, this is great. This is going to be great. A lot of times it's like the team drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, like everyone just is in love with what they're working on, but is kind of blind to its flaws. Sometimes it's just things coming out of left field. I mean, a big example is a project that I worked on for two years toward the end of my time at Playdom Disney. And it was a park building game. So sort of a Cityville type game, but using Disney park assets. Uh huh. And this was for Facebook, which was a platform that was pretty much 100% flash wasn't a unity platform, you know, there's back then there were almost no one had unity on their PC, at least, you know, particularly casual gamers who were the target audience for this. But we also wanted a game that was really technically robust, you know, that was more, well, actually our GM at the time, John Pleasance put it this way. He said, it can't just be Cityville with Disney assets smeared on top of it. You know, it has to be something that really blows people's socks off. So we made the decision to build the game in Unity. And Unity at the time was promising a suite of tools that would convert Unity code into Flash code. Uh huh. So we spent. I think know, I at, see where this one's going. At, 
you know, it was supposed to be delivered, you know, in maybe a six to 12 month time frame, And that time came and went and more, more months and more months went by and they finally delivered it and it didn't do half the stuff that they had originally promised. And we had to write a bunch of, you know, utilities ourselves. And we finally got the game basically limping in flash, did a soft launch in the Philippines and the performance was so horrible. I cannot describe how horrible it was. The metrics were terrible. You know, that's something I've seen before too. Do you remember there was that studio in Canada that sued Epic for not properly delivering on Unreal Engine? This was like a good eight, nine years ago, if not more, maybe GameCube era. No, I Um, I don't recall that. Yeah, it went to court. I don't know where it ended up, but definitely this happens when you're trying to bring in new tech. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically to bring it back full circle, you know, we we eventually did a second soft launch in the Philippines in Unity, and the game ran fantastically. For everyone who played the game, the metrics were terrific, except we lost about three quarters of players on that early screen where it said you need to down, you know, you need to install Unity if you want to play the game, and poof, you know, we lost three quarters of all players at that point. So economically, the game was just unlaunchable. You can't you know, lose three quarters of your acquired users at the first step and and have a, a game that's going to be viable in, in the user acquisition channel. So essentially, we had a game that wasn't launchable in Flash and it wasn't launchable in Unity, but the game was terrific. <laughs> I mean, it, everyone everyone agreed, and and of course, the metrics of the the Unity test sort of showed that had we been able to get the the game into people's hands, it would have been a huge success. One of the reasons this show exists is to help creatives learn enough of what matters in terms of production or business or marketing to help them have a better chance. Um, at, at addressing some of those pitfalls along the way. Is, are there any other things that show up for you in terms of things that have caused projects to not be as successful as they could have been creatively, but these other issues get in the way? I'd say one is moderate your ambition. I mean, it's just so easy to sort of fall in love with every feature and say, yes, that makes the game better. Let's include that. Let's include that. Let's include yeah. that. And you keep one plusing and it keeps increasing the development effort and it keeps pushing out your launch date, etc. And it's much better to, you know, I'd say keep a really strict eye on that, you know, sort of what is the MVP? What is the core set of features that we really need to launch with? And, you know, of course, nowadays where most projects are live ops anyway, you know, anything that doesn't make it into that initial launch doesn't mean it's it's never going to happen. It can happen later as a post-launch feature or a live event or that sort of a thing. But I've just seen a lot of projects founder on the, you know, the one plusing and, and then it just drags down everything because everyone, you know, all your resources, your team are just stretched too thin. And instead of, you know, taking a smaller number of things and making them really, really good, everything, you know, ends or many things end up coming out mediocrely. Yeah. Are there any, are there any frameworks you like to use to kind of keep your eye on what matters and and maybe what, what can be cut or or postponed? Not really. I'm not a big framework guy. I, I guess I'm, I'm somewhat more of a gut guy. So more, you just sort of think about what you're going for and kind of compare the op- the the feature or the element to that and, and see if it strikes you as kind of a fit. I certainly like having kind of a document which outlines the vision and outlines the pillars and is something which when someone says, hey, you know, it would be really cool if we added this and you can kind of hold it up to that and say, does this support yeah one you know one of those pillars or does it support that vision or is this you know as nice an idea as it is as you know fun as we all agree that would be to have in the game it's orthogonal you know it's 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 sort of secondary yeah that's great and i think that's also a, a nice way of dealing with community feedback too when you are live if it if it is a live ops game you start getting a lot of ideas that way too it's great to have something you can use to kind of show you're listening, but that you have, you have a certain way of 
addressing or, or, de- or determining what works. Yep. Now I want to turn to story and writing a little bit or turn back to it because we touched on it briefly. You have, you know, you've written a lot of games that, that have really touched people both with your comedy and with the emotion and the characters. I, I find that game writing is something that I wish was better generally. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you, do you have that feeling that, that it sometimes doesn't live up to maybe the opportunities that games provide for, for storytelling? Sure, but it is hard. Mm-hmm. Storytelling is sort of by its nature a pretty, pretty linear medium, and games by their nature are a pretty nonlinear medium. And they sort of don't mix together well. There's there's a bit of an oil and water thing. Yeah. So it is very hard to do narrative with within games. And so many of the easy ways to do it, you know, just having some gameplay and then the gameplay suddenly stops and you have a episode, you know, or, you know, kind of a, a little bit of, of narrative from a linear sequence. And then it ends, and then the gameplay resumes. And that's just not really an integration of gameplay and story. It's it's more of, you know, now we have gameplay, now we have story. It's one or the other. It's not really an integration. So there's that. I also think about Sturgeon's Law, Ted Sturgeon, the, the science fiction author, who famously said 90% of all science fiction is crap, but then again, 90% of everything is crap. Right, right. And of course, depends on your definition of crap. I always thought Sturgeon was being relatively forgiving. You know, I think the, <laughs> the real number is more like 99.9%. But depending on kind of how high a bar you're setting, you know, how high your standards are, then, you know, you're mostly going to be disappointed because very few things are, you know, kind of the the epitome of of whatever format you're you're looking at whether it's games music writing movies so i think there's certainly room for improvement there's certainly room to celebrate you know some of the notable successes that we've had what are some of those for you like the, what games that you feel like have have done a great job well, one that I always point to is her story. Uh huh. Yep. Um, I, you know, very small, fairly quick to play indie game, but I would say from a narrative point of view, that probably gripped me more than any game that I've ever played. And certainly it was a case where the game mechanic and the narrative were, you know, definitely intertwined, not not separate as as in the examples that I was giving earlier. Yeah. It's interesting. They take a linear medium and they chop it up so much and then make it interactive. It was you know, very, very innovative. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that it did well because so often something as experimental as that, you know, gets seen by a few people who laud it, but then it sort of never, never goes wide. I think that, uh, you know, something, an advantage that games like Her Story and, and also the Infocom's, Infocom games had is that there wasn't necessarily all these other constraints and all these other things that were, that were you know, taking as much of a priority, right? Like, they, both those jo- sort of realms of games really were able to prioritize story, where if you're, in, if you're playing some current blockbuster AAA action adventure, the story is living along with all these other constraints and considerations true although i'd have to say just from a purely market driven point of view the story was really only i'd say of secondary consideration for us at infocom and it was really the puzzles that were primary because Mm -hmm. at the time we were selling games through the retail channel price point of 40 or 50 dollars which, you know, we're talking early 80s dollars. That's probably like selling something for well over $100 nowadays. And and so it had to deliver a pretty significant amount of playtime to sort of justify price points like that. 
And so the puzzles were, were, were just so key to creating a game that would keep someone occupied for many tens of hours. If one, and, and these games were tiny. I mean, my first game was about 110 kilobytes. That, wow. was, that was as big as you could fit on, on a floppy disk for a PC in, in 1983. And so, so if the games had been in that format, but without the puzzles, they would be something that would almost certainly be completable in, in an hour or two. And, and so it never would have been economically viable. And, and when it came to the puzzle design, was that also like a pretty intuitive process for you? Did you, you know, would you be taking out, you know, pad and paper and kind of working things out? What was, what was that process like? In terms of the intersection of the storytelling and the puzzle design, sometimes as you're creating a game, you're kind of focused on one element and sometimes on the other element. I once heard an interview with Paul Simon, the songwriter, and he was talking about when you're writing, do you write the lyrics first or do you write the tune first? Mm. And, you know, he said sometimes one way and sometimes the other way, but when it's best is when they both kind of come into my brain simultaneously. And as an example, he said, bridge over troubled water, you know, that one like bridge over troubled water. And he said that you know, good, tune Steve. and lyric popped into my mind simultaneously. And I feel like the same thing with kind of narrative design and puzzle design in those text adventure games, when you weren't doing one or the other, but it kind of came together in one, in one, you know, kind of simultaneous fusion. I also wanted to mention the rather interesting example of one of my favorite puzzles that actually came to me in a dream, which Perfect. was in my game, Leather Goddesses of Phobos. And it was this device called a tea remover. And basically it was a little machine with a compartment and you could put stuff that were small enough to fit in that compartment and then turn it on. And it would basically take the object and remove the tea. So one of the things that you could put in it was a rabbit and that would turn it into a rabbi. <laughs> but the, the puzzle that you needed to use it for it to solve was there was this character, King Miter, and everything he touched turned into a 90 degree angle. And so he had accidentally touched his daughter, but he'd only brushed her and turned her into like a 82 degree angle or something. <laughs> and, but anyway, he was despondent and, you know, wanted her back. And somewhere in the game, you find a bottle of untangling cream. And if you put that in the tea remover, it turns into unangling cream, which you can then put on King Miter's daughter and she's mm. restored. So anyway, that, you know, obviously like bizarre puzzle or even multi-part puzzle, it literally came to me in a dream. Wow. That and, fortunately yeah, I retained I mean, when I woke up combining the the language itself the words of the story itself kind of fit into the puzzle it's very very elegant elegant and and yet hilarious and yet hilarious so let's let's dive in a little bit to ip development you have have had a lot of experience both working with existing ip and bringing them to games and also doing original ip how how do you approach the process of ip development Certainly, going back to the Infocom games, I worked with IP that had already been established. So my second game was Sorcerer, which effectively was the fifth game in the Zork series. And then the last game that I did at Infocom was Zork Zero, which was essentially the, the prequel to the original Zork trilogy. You know, so I don't really consider in either of those cases that I was helping to originate IP, although you know, I feel like I took an existing IP and moved it forward. I mean, you could say that my game Planetfall created an IP. We did a sequel, Station Fall. There was a novelization of it. Mm -hmm. Activision, on several occasions, initiated projects to do a third Planetfall game, but nothing that ever came out. Leather, leather Goddesses, right? Again, in kind of in what way was that an IP? I mean, obviously, it, it was an IP for that one title, but... Oh, there was a sequel, but it, it was horrible. It was 
basically I, I did a design and handed that off to Activision and they implemented it as they were going through bankruptcy. Activision actually went into chapter 11 circa 1991 or so, moved from the Bay Area down to LA. The current Activision really is almost, you know, no relationship to to the pre-bankruptcy Activision. Well, we, we can take this any way you want, but I, it's inter- it's an interesting distinction because to me, if you make an, an original game, even if, if there's not a bunch of, you know, additional properties that come out of it, it's still an original IP. Yeah, but I, sure. I take the point that, uh, you know, if it becomes this bigger thing, then the IP is really, you know, turned into having a life of its own. Right, right. So, I mean, if you just want to take Leather Goddesses as an example, well, what what came first with Leather Goddesses was the title. The title really just started as a joke. Infocom was having a party. And at the time, the company was still pretty small, probably less than 20 people. And we were in one fairly small office that had a central room that was our conference room. And it was also our micro room. That is the room where we had sort of one of each PC of that time period. And one entire wall was just a chalkboard. And on that chalkboard, we had what was called the matrix. Down uh, one side was a list of every game that we had released. And along the top was basically every PC that we were supporting. And then what kind of filled in this matrix was what was the current version out in the marketplace. You know, so you could say, oh, okay, you know, Zork 1, currently version 82 of Zork 1 is what's uh, being released on the Apple II or on the Atari 800. And that was important because, you know, effectively we were always updating the games with new features such as undo or, or fixing bugs. And so you'd want to know, oh, you know, is, is this bug present right now in the, you know, IBM PC version of Deadline? So anyway, Infocom was having sort of its first party, not a really big party, but just inviting some important members of the press and and people in the Boston area who had chains of computer game stores and things like that. And right before the party started, I added a line to the matrix that just said Leather Goddesses of Phobos with some fake numbers under each of the of the machines. And why Joel, did you, what inspired you to put that up there? Oh, just basically pranking, you know, mostly Joel, who is, who is our president and who is like, you know, just really um, anxious, you know, that this party even as unambitious or, you know, small of an event as it was would, would go off flawlessly. And he saw it, you know, literally like moments before the first people were to arrive and, you know, I've, he could never erased it faster. And Nevertheless, you know, sort of the name stuck in Infocom lore and people were always referring to it, you know, almost jokingly as, you know, oh, so what are you going to write next? Oh, maybe Leather Goddess is a Phobos. And then at some point, you know, it came time for me to decide what was I going to write next? And I said, why not Leather Goddess is a Phobos? Everyone loves the name. We've been talking about it for years. And, and so I started working on the game with nothing more than that title. And so, so basically what it said to me was sort of early space opera, sort of pre golden age of science fiction, you know, flash Gordon pulp, pulp science fiction. Yeah. And so I just sort of started researching that time period. Brian Moriarty had the the great idea of including a 3d comic in the package and I sort of set it in a world that kind of reminded me of the the solar system as portrayed in those days, sort of that 1930s period. So, you know, back when it, you know, it was commonly portrayed that, that planets like Venus and Mars would have, you know, sort of full intelligent civilizations, you know, much like Earth. And, and of course, you know, I definitely wanted it to be a comedy. So everything that I did was kind of focused on making sure that the game was, was as funny and silly as possible. And of course the game also promised some 
ribaldness. And so kind of a big part of the initial design was kind of figuring out where the right balance was between delivering on that and, you know, not making it kind of objectionable that would, you know, get any stores to not want to carry it or anything. And anyway, that's sort of the, that describes the first few months I spent working on Leather Goddesses. And I guess, you know, that, that was the IP development for, for that particular title. So Steve, you know, once you've created an IP and, and you've had some success with it, how do you, how do you go about, you know, leveraging it further? Where do you take it from there? One example, actually two examples from Playdom, neither of them that successful. We had a very early hit game on both MySpace and Facebook that was called Mobsters. And where was this? You cut out for a sec. I'm sorry. So this was at Playdom. So this was circa 2008, 2009. And we had a very early hit game on both MySpace and Facebook that was called Mobsters. Very simple RPG. And the game wasn't very well designed. Uh, it was already live when I arrived at Playdom and the kind of economy hadn't been well designed. And so essentially soft currency had become completely meaningless. Every player after their first few days had infinite soft currency, basically, as far as the game was concerned. And so one of my marching orders was create us a sequel to Mobsters that will leverage the IP, but have a better designed economy so that it will monetize better. So I did that and we created a game that was more heavily narrative, that was a little more visually robust. It was still pretty primitive, you know, I'd say compared to most modern standards. But essentially the original Mobsters was almost entirely text with with just some like simple icons representing each item that you bought. Yeah. This this game was at least slightly illustrated. Say each each mission or each scene, you know, would have at least a a still 2D image. Anyway, it was not as big a success as Mobsters, even though I'm thinking that per player it monetized way better, but it just never got the the traffic. I mean, by the time it came out, the you know there was so much more competition for players on Facebook than there had been when Mobsters launched a couple of years earlier. Right. Um, and Facebook had the kind of viral mecha- mechanics or opportunities they they told right, and they were tamping down on that. What would you say, you know, from those experiences, what would you say is the takeaway for someone who maybe has something and is thinking about sequeling it or trying to make a second improved version? Actually, here's another good example from Playdom, which was the most successful game that Playdom ever did, or maybe the the second most successful game after our our Marvel game. It was called Gardens of Time. Uh And it it was a hidden object game was the core gameplay. But then from that core gameplay, you're earning decorations that you're using to decorate a garden. And because it was a time travel themed game, you're traveling all over time and doing hidden object screens in ancient Greece or Victorian England or what have you. And then you're earning decorations from that time period, which you can then place in your garden. So your garden could have an Egyptian section or, you know, an ancient Roman section. I played that game. That was fun. It was and very successful. And so Playdom started doing some other hidden object games, but instead of trying to leverage the IP of gardens of time, the next game that came out was just a mystery game set in, I think Victorian England or, you know, some sort of period like that. And the two main characters ran a detective agency. And so the name of the game was Blackwood and Bell's Mysteries or something like that. And so here we have, you know, one of the most successful games on Facebook. We're doing a new game in the same genre, but doing absolutely nothing to leverage the fact that we have this hit game. Right. So, you know, and, and I was pushing, we're doing, you know, this, this mystery game, right? Let's call it Gardens of Crime. <laughs> and 
play off the success of Gardens of Time and, and just, you know, essentially create a line of games that would all be tied you, you, together. You remove the T, Steve. <laughs> that would be Gardens of Ime. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I was ignored and Playdom was was a fairly balkanized, it was, it was sort of a, a, a loosely tied together set of studios that often were somewhat competitive with each other instead of cooperative. And anyway, so the game was released as Blackwood and Bell and, and did not do anything close to the, the numbers that, that Gardens of Time did. Hmm. Now, you've also done you know a lot of games with existing IP and, and famously with Hitchhiker's Guide. What's been your approach there to you know taking and adapting existing IP? Definitely a big piece of using existing IP is essentially managing the IP owner, managing the IP representatives. So Hitchhikers was a very special case because I was working directly with Douglas Adams, who was the IP originator and the IP owner. But a more typical case is, you know, whoever originated the IP you're not dealing with them, you know, it's owned by a large company, you're dealing with representatives, you're dealing with, you know, people for whom it's just a job, it's not their baby, so to speak. But it's it's kind of all over the place. Sometimes there are super strict rules about what you can do, what you can't do. In fact, an interesting example was when I was working on that park building game at Playdom Disney, we were working with lots of different IP owners all across Disney. And the rules were just so different. I mean, obviously there was Mickey Mouse and he was sacrosanct. And, you know, the rules for using Mickey Mouse, you know, could fill a a three-inch binder. But then there were other characters who, you know, for whom the rules were like way looser. And, you know, if you wanted to use, I don't know, Peter Pan or something like that, you know, the hoops that you had to jump through were were fairly minimal. Pixar was incredibly sticky to work with. They had not only really high standards for what you did with their characters or with their IP, but they were also super busy and just really hard to kind of get cycles from, to get permission from, to get sign off from. So yeah, you kind of had to learn almost IP by IP within the Disney family what all the different rules were and who the right people to talk to were and what you could do, what you couldn't do. And just because you couldn't do it with this character didn't mean that you couldn't do it or, or shouldn't try asking about this other character. If you were doing a new IP today or getting a new, new game for ambitious folks trying to start something up brand new, what do you think would be the way to go about that now? Well, I guess first principles are know know the audience. Who who are you making this game for? Right. And and so you want to certainly avoid an IP mismatch. You know, if you're making a casual game, you know, you might be like a big fan of zombie apocalypses, but that's not going to be a good choice for your IP here. Or if you're making a game for a midcore audience, you know, like farming or cooking is not, you know, not the way to go. And also probably finding a nice middle ground. You don't want something that's been done to death. You know, I think farming is a good example. My gut sense is that people are pretty sick of farming as as a theme. But you also don't want something that's too kind of offbeat or niche or kind of hard to telegraph in, you know, a quick ad or a single image or, you know, the three seconds that a player is going to give you when they stumble upon your page on the app store. So, so kind of finding that middle ground between something that, that isn't done to death, but something that is at least got some familiarity and, and is going to resonate with players. And then obviously, I mean, there's so many things that go into IP creation. There's naming, there's coming up with characters coming up with an interesting set of characters and how are they going to interact with each other? 
and what are their personalities and kind of make them interesting and give them quirks and, you know, don't make them, you know, just sort of bland cookie cutter characters. And what's the backstory of the world? For the character development piece, do you have a particular way you like to do that? Do you, do you write up the characters separately from the story? How do you yeah, make yeah usually, you know, I'll take, you know, however many significant characters there are. And obviously that depends a lot on what type of game it is, et cetera. But, you know, let's say there are five significant characters and I'll just write up maybe a three page or so story about them. You know, where were they born? What are their interests? You know, where did they go to school? What do they love? What do they hate? You know, what are their quirks? What are their hobbies? You know, a little bit like kind of writing up those player personas, which mm -hmm. I find fairly useful, particularly at this stage of a game when you're trying to figure out, okay, who are we writing this for? And also kind of getting the entire team all on the same page of, of thinking uniformly about who they're writing the game for. But in, in this case, you know, you're, you're writing them up in both cases, they're, they're fictitious characters, but in, in, in one case, you know, they're, they're char the people who you're writing the game for. In the other case, it's, it's people who are going to be appearing in your game. And I find that those are really interesting to, you know, just really make sure a, that the character is interesting, that it's sort of a diverse lineup, that the interactions between the characters are going to, going to be interesting. And, you know, you're, especially if this is a live service game, you're going to have to be writing kind of dialogue and action and, you know, kind of events for these characters for potentially years to come. You want to make sure that, that they're interesting enough and kind of deep enough to support that. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and when it comes to the kind of the, the story of the world or the kind of the backstory, you were, you were mentioning that as well. How do you approach that? It's kind of hard to give a one size fits all approach to that it depends so much on what kind of world it is what kind of game it is you know casual mid core you know live ops or not you know is it going to be a small indie-ish effort you know is it going to be a a big effort you know three month development time two year development time there's you know, sort of so much you kind of need to know and take into consideration before you can say, okay, you know, how do we design this world? Everyone is, is pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah. It depends a lot on the project and I guess the need for story or backstory is going to vary a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Anything else you want the playmakers audience to know? Well, whole wheat bread is always healthier than white. Right. Probably Spr they all knew that anyway. Or there. They're an intelligent group. Yeah, probably. Thanks for coming on the show. This has been this has been fun as always. I always have a, a, a smile on my face when I'm when I'm talking to you. Well, I I always have a smile on my face when I'm talking to you too, Jordan. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that interview with the great Steve Moretzky. If you're interested in working with Steve on what you're working on. You can find him on LinkedIn. I'll go ahead and put a link to his LinkedIn profile in the show notes. You can find it right there or just look him up on the LinkedIn and you can uh, reach out directly. Now, those of you who have made it here before to the end of the episode may know about the end of the episode Inner Circle Secret Club. Now, some of you may be new here. And that's that's great. We welcome new members to the secret end of the episode inner circle club um i've got something good for you this week so i i'm sure i made some promises last week about like hey if you make it to the end next week i'll have something i don't remember what those are and and let's be real uh, you know whatever i said last week if it's just that was that was last week but i'm gonna whatever it was i've got something better that's the thing i'm gonna deliver something better and here's what that is me and steve talking about the air quality in San Francisco during the airpocalypse that was happening and is happening. Uh, that's, that's what I got for you on this week's secret inner circle club content BTS action. Um, let me set the stage here. So as you heard at the top of the episode, 
me and Steve were about to start the interview and then my doorbell rang because I had to pick something up, some, um, you know, Amazon delivery or something like that. And I have to go up and down the stairs in our, my apartment in San Francisco. Um, I have to take the stairs. I can't buzz people in. So I ran down the three flights of stairs and I ran up the three, three flights of stairs and I was totally winded. And, um, and that's when Steve started talking to me about the air quality, I guess, because he heard how gassed I was. Uh, and he's telling me about the app that he uses to check the air quality. And that's where we pick up with this clip. Let's get to it. And uh, Purple Air, it's the website where they just have monitors all over California. And you can just see what the current air quality is close okay. to you. Oh, oh. And yeah, the I one closest to me, one closest to me right now is 298. Holy shit. I'm at, oh my God, I'm at 234. Holy shit. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. Anything really two, bad. Anything over 200 is pretty bad. Um, okay, hold on. Let's just forget about the apocalypse for a little while. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, if I kill over during the interview, you'll know why. Uh, okay. <laughs> Steve, welcome to Playmakers. It's great to have you on the show. And it is a delight to be here. Okay, that is the clip, and I just think it's so hilarious that that is actually how we started the real interview Thank you, Steve, for being such a great sport and uh, <laughs> and for giving me some good laughs during what is a pretty challenging week here in California and San Francisco. And to all the millions and billions of people listening out there, thank you for listening to Playmakers. I appreciate you, and I can't wait to see you on the next episode.